flow of uh, questions. So good morning, afternoon, and evening to all joining us from different time zones from across the world. Thank you for coming to this fireside chat with Rahaf Harfush today to talk about her book, Hustle and Float, that you can see behind me, and uh, discuss the themes within the book, including burnout, productivity, and creativity. So Rahaf is a digital anthropologist, author, member of France's National Digital Council, a professor, academic, and executive director of the Red Thread Institute of Digital Culture. And she's joining us today from France, and that is her real background, not her Zoom background. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raha, for the gift of your time and wisdom. I know you've had a busy day and you have one right after this as well. So when we, when we were looking for speakers and guests, we were looking for someone who would chat to us about time management and productivity. But you know, that didn't feel right for us after months in a pandemic to talk about how to be more productive using taskless apps and managing our time better. It was clear that the most important conversation to have was to learn compassionate ways to reframe our relationship um, with this rather, as you mentioned, a rather outdated concept of productivity. And as Rahaf puts it, we have forgotten how to float. So today we would love to discuss how important that float portion of the book is um, as we prepare to move forward within the academy, but also as in the post pandemic future. So welcome again. For those that just joined us, make sure to put your questions in the chat box and keep yourselves muted for now. So the WHO Rahaf defines burnout as a syndrome, a chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. Um, academia has been fostering burnout since forever, but an article just came out three days ago that looked at burnout in academia in the context of the pandemic. And the results were not surprising. I mean, the data showed that 70% felt more stress in 22, 2020, while 75% of women reported feeling stress. So to begin with, Rahaf, I wanted to start with how you begin in the book, by sharing your personal story with burnout. How did you recognize the symptoms of burnout and what were some of the factors that led up to it? Thank you so much. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be able to spend this hour with you talking about my work. Thank you for supporting Hustle and Float. Um, thank you for reading it. It always makes me feel so good to see it out uh, in the wild. So very, very much appreciated. Um, this book, I never really meant to write this book. It sort of happened because a couple of years ago, as I, as I write in the introduction, I had a very severe episode of burnout. Um, Looking back, the symptoms were everything that the World Health Organization described. It was uh, depression, it was exhaustion, it was physical symptoms, but I didn't really take it seriously until my hair started falling out. And when my hair started falling out, that's when I was like, okay, there's something very wrong. And you know, you go on Google and you look up all sorts of awful things <laughs> medically that you could potentially have. And I went to my doctor thinking I had all sorts of terrible illnesses. And my doctor was just, just said, no, you're burnt out. You are too stressed and your body, you're not giving your body enough of an opportunity to recover. And what was really interesting about that experience is that it was very, very traumatic for me when it happened because I couldn't work. I couldn't write. I couldn't um, ideate. I couldn't do anything creative. I couldn't even watch TV. I just sat on my couch. Like that's how exhausted I was. And it was very scary because I've worked my entire life. I've been working ever since I was 15 years old, you know? And so to not be able to work was, was quite, quite terrifying. And during it, I started paying attention to the voice in my head that was like guilt tripping me for taking the time. You know, why wasn't I bouncing back fast enough? Why was I so weak that like I let this happen to me? Why couldn't I get ready? Like, why couldn't I get better faster? It was just this like terrible, terrible um, time. And then I really hit rock bottom when at one point, and this sounds always very dramatic to sort of tell people, but in the, in the moment, it really felt like it was quite serious. And I just thought to myself, you know, there's a possibility that I might never write. I might never be able to write anything again. I might've genuinely broken my brain in such a way that I can't do anything anymore. That was the turning point because the second I sort of accept the fact that who I was wasn't going to be linked to my professional identity, I almost felt like a big weight lift off of my shoulders, a big release of pressure. 
And as I started to get better, I really started to question like, how had this happened to me? Why had this happened to me? Considering that I know all about taking breaks. I know all about time management. I know all about resting and sleeping and eating good food and taking care of ourselves. So despite knowing all of this, how could it be that somebody that had this information still got into the state? And trying to answer that question turned into a three-year research project where I spoke to um, creatives, academics, professors, doctors, lawyers, bankers, designers, dancers. I mean, the whole wide variety of anybody that I considered to be a creative professional and kept hearing the same story over and over again. And that's when I wrote the book. The book is really about uncovering this hidden relationship that we have with work and naming these forces that I call out in the book as being just always in the background. And that it's not until we can call out those forces, recognize how they influence us, that we can liberate ourselves from this like cult that we've created in our culture around being hyperproductive. Yeah, I have so many questions based on just what you said. There were a lot of elements that I'd like to sort of explore as we go forward. And I just want to make a comment on the book. This book is for anthropologists, engineers, scientists, social scientists, humanists, students, scholars. Actually, everyone who's in this audience reflects those backgrounds. You do an amazing job in the book of uh, delving into the back history of where our concepts of work culture come from. And that you mentioned that in order to uh, know where we're going, it's important to know where we came from. I like that analogy of sort of pulling at that thread and tugging at that thread that you gave in the book. Um, mm. You even trace it back to the Industrial Revolution times and then bring it back to the era of like Elon Musk and I, I guess Beyonce is your favorite because Beyonce is mentioned, like <laughs> Beyonce is everyone, which we can all relate to. Um, you know, so I, I mean, I thought about this the other day while watching the Grammys as well, 28, you know, Grammys. I mean, that's productivity and creativity, which I'd like to talk about because you, you mentioned the term productive creatives mm -hmm. in the book lot. Um, who is a productive creative and how do you see sort of researchers, scientists, engineers, humanists present here today who so, and also university staff, how do they fall into that category of being productive creatives? That's a great question. And, you know, you bring up a good point, which is the word creativity has a lot of like meaning and weight assigned to it. And some people think, oh, I'm not creative if I'm not a writer or an artist or a photographer or a designer. But in reality, when you look at what being creative actually means, it's just your capacity to solve problems, make connections between new ideas and create things, not necessarily art, but create ideas, solutions, technology research, um, diagnoses, like any a, a body of work. And so for my definition, considering we're in a knowledge economy, if you work at a job where you need to problem solve, you need to research, you need to explore new ideas, you need to learn new things, you need to apply those new things in different contexts, then I consider you to be a productive creative. So it's really all of us. Okay, yeah, I, I thought that too. I thought uh, all the examples that you were giving, I could relate it back to being an academic scholar. My, my time and my students' time in uh, the labs and writing. So, and you say in the first part of the book that productivity and creativity are at odds with one another. And that's where we're mm -hmm. at in this knowledge economy. You can't exactly be productive and creative. Uh, and that that tension is so apparent. And that tension is so apparent in academia because in academia, you're expected to be that uh, creative and productive at the same time. In fact, the whole system is built on producing more data, more papers, more books, uh, get your pu book, books published or papers published before you're swiped, publish or perish. These are the concepts that are so uh, prevalent within academia. At the same time, you're expected to use your brains, multitask, be creative, uh, and there's that snooze or lose culture. You know, you have to be fast paced. So how does one begin to dismantle such an age old institution and disrupt the culture in, in a meaningful way? would love to hear your thoughts about how you can reconcile the, that tension that you mentioned between those two ideologies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I want to clarify something because I think it's so it's so important that when I talk about productivity being incompatible, I don't talk about productivity in general, like being productive as a concept is not a bad thing. It's just the system that we have been using in our society up until this point to measure create to measure productivity and to measure, um, you know, what it means to be productive. That's the problem. So I think that it doesn't make a lot of sense for academics or for productive creators or for writers. I don't think it makes sense for us to use a system that was designed 
for assembly line work during the industrial revolution. That doesn't mean that you can't, you shouldn't produce things. It just means maybe there's a smart way to produce things and that the way that a creative brain works and coming up with research and in having to work in a fast paced environment and having to balance multiple priorities. I'm not saying don't be productive. I'm just saying maybe productivity looks different if it was the system that was built by us for us instead of a system that was imposed on us from you know 150 years ago. Yeah, I kept wondering all through, that's right, because you're, what you're talking about is sort of the metrics of success. What does success look like in terms of, you know, you're successful if you have X number of papers within the academy and maybe that's where the disruption needs to happen. I think there is that people are craving and striving for this altar of culture in academia. But within academia, I, I feel like outside of academia, in like a real world uh, um, a work situation, when you're feeling that sort of stifling uh, feeling, and you mention it in your book, you can leave your job. You can, you can look for another place that values your creativity without putting so much pressure. But I kept wondering, how do we do this in academia when there exists such a power dynamic and hierarchy between, let's say, academic advisors and some of our students? Um, you know, when your creativity is not valued, sometimes it feels like you're kind of stuck in academia. You have to finish the five years and you, sometimes your visa is tied with, uh, with, with your time in academia. So um, how, what do we do about sort of disrupting that power dynamic? I think that's a, that's a really good question. And this might be a bit controversial, but I think that you have to start with yourself, right? Like if you are going to stay within the system and that is your choice that you're choosing to stay with your system, within the system, you either let the system destroy you or you learn to thrive within the system in a way that protects your productivity and that protects your creativity. Mm -hmm. So if you can't, you know, you can't really expect to come in and make these grand sweeping changes to beliefs and behaviors that have been around for hundreds of years. So the only thing that you can really do is to say to yourself, okay, how am I going to design my system of work so that I can survive and not just survive so that I can thrive within this, within this like fast paced field. And that might mean changing the way that you take breaks. That might mean being more realistic about your, your production and about what you're outputting and knowing that you're in it for the long haul. Like, does it like, what is the point if I'm going to put out 10 papers in one year and at the end of that year, I'm going to be totally exhausted and maybe not capable of doing any research for two to three years because I'm so exhausted and burnt out versus putting out five papers every year for five years, which on the, you know, in the longer scheme of things might actually be more productive, more reasonable, more realistic, and more humane. So it's really about asking yourself, and this is really hard too, like, noticing that we are a part of the system, we play a part in the system, we choose to engage with these narratives, we choose to work ourselves to the bone. Those are choices that we make. And so the very, very first step has to be that we have to take accountability and we have to say, no, we're not going to participate in the system in this way. And I say that, but I also want to clarify, I'm also not blaming us for systems that are imposed on us. It's not my intention to say, oh, well, just because you're taking responsibility, that means that institutions aren't going to take responsibility. That's not what I mean at all. But my point is, is that so many of us are under the thumb, under like being manipulated by these systems without even knowing. So the first, first step is recognizing how these systems are manipulating you. They're manipulating you in ways that are hurting your capacity to do your work. And once you free yourself from that, then you, you can say, okay, I'm going to go back to the basics and I'm going to say, what can I learn about my creativity? What can I learn about what I need to work? What can I learn about my goals and my ambitions and my attitude around work that I can build my own system for me to live within this bigger system? And that's what I did for myself. You know, I teach at a university, I work with students, I research, I write, I publish, like all of those things. But I had to learn very quickly to create my own system because if I tried to keep up with what everybody else was doing, it I tried that before and it didn't work. So I had to find a new way because the old ways just aren't working for many people. So we don't have a choice really. Yeah, I think you say this in the last, last chapter as well. It starts with you. Um, you know, the, the onus is on us in the beginning. And today in almost exasperation, I was talking to my husband, we were both in the lab together, same lab, same environment, um, same end goal was to graduate. Whereas I would spend, you know, weekends in the lab and 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Whereas he would spend at 3 o'clock, 3.30, he would leave the lab, go to the gym and not come back every single every single day. And 
I was I was saying, but yeah, but I had a lot more at stake. I felt like I had a lot more to prove um, as an international student as well. I felt like that American dream that you talk about in the book was very, very real for me. So just to give the audience uh, a little bit of con a context in the book, you mentioned this thing called the American dream, that there is a notion that the more hardworking you are, the more successful you are. And so, you know, many of us researchers are immigrants, international researchers, who hold close this concept of this American dream. You're not saying don't work hard to achieve the dream, dream of building better life, but you do talk about and warn us about something called the shadow dream. Can you mm -hmm. explain to us what this concept of a shadow dream is and why and how we should be wary of this shadow dream? Yeah, so the shadow dream is like the dark side of the American dream or the Canadian dream or the French dream because it kind of exists in different iterations, though it's most predominantly in American and North American culture. So if the American dream is this idea that if you work hard enough, you will be successful, then the shadow dream says, well, if you're not successful, it must be because you're not working hard enough. Not socioeconomic factors, not wage stagnation, not income inequality, not social injustices, not access to education and healthcare and access to opportunities, not where you were born, not who you were born to, not the advantages that your parents have, not your privilege, but just how hard you work. So when people see that they're not where they want to be, they then internalize that and they say, oh, it's my fault because I'm not doing enough. And because they're constantly being told how to do more, 10 tips to hack your day, get up earlier, hashtag 5am club, hashtag last one at the office, hashtag team never sleeps. Like once you do, once you see all of those things, what all of those things are actually telling you is what you're doing is never enough. So you feel like your success is your, your lack of success is your fault because you're not putting in enough effort and you feel like you're not doing enough, which then you feel like you are not enough because we have completely confounded the, the idea. We've completely combined the idea of your self-worth and your productivity as a human being are almost becoming interchangeable. And if you're not producing something, then you're not worthy. You're not a worthy member of society. You don't have any worth, which is absolutely not the case. And so it's so important to look at I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we have to work hard, but we also have to work smart. And for your partner, when he went to the gym, he understood that going to the gym gave him more energy, more resources in order for him to be able to, for, to perform better. And it's very counterintuitive because people all also think they have, we have this idea that if I work for eight hours and I get eight hours worth of work, if I work for 16 hours, I'm going to get double that. I'm going to get 16 hours worth of work, but that's not actually true because the level of your work at hour one through eight is going to be very different than the work you're producing hour 13, hour 14, hour 15 hours. So by hour 16, you are not producing the same output as hour one, but yet we've internalized this idea where despite the fact that the data shows us that this is not the case, we cling to it because we're so conditioned, we're so brainwashed to believe that our success is entirely dependent on our capacity to work harder. And the answer is always more work, more work. What if the answer is less work? What if the answer is less work so that you can be smarter about your goals, more strategic about your decisions, more careful with your energy, more intentional with your attention? What if all, wouldn't all those things actually help you perform better in the long run than just sitting in front of a screen for 16 hours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely some food for thought because you know I opened the, the I opened Clubhouse today, and I probably have to curate my what I see because the first thing early in the morning six six a.m. notifications kept coming in and it was the Hustlers Club and how to be more focused at work and I just I couldn't. Oh my it. God! Block, <laughs> block, mute, unfollow, delete. Uh -huh. Just like not like, look if you open up social media mm -hmm. and if you see things that are coming in, take an audit of yourself. Like, how do you feel when you see those things? If you feel motivated and excited and you feel happy and you feel inspired then cool, your feed is doing great, you know? But if you feel like, oh, I should have gotten up earlier, I should have done this, there's more things I have to do. If you feel pressure or stressed or um, insecure, or if you feel like people are triggering your imposter syndrome, just delete, block and delete. Yeah. Um, may I ask people to, um, can I ask you to mute? Okay, I'll just go ahead and mute you. Um, I'm going to get to audience questions that are in the uh, chat box, but I wanted to uh, jump off of what you were saying earlier with the with the aspect of privilege. 
um, and you know, oftentimes, you know, black, Hispanic, international students uh, uh, say, well, can I afford to float in this competitive work culture? I myself have used this phrase recently, maybe like two, three weeks ago with my friend here, and I've said, oh my gosh, as a brown immigrant woman and mother, I feel like I'm hustling all the time. How can I not though? Because if I, if I don't, then I'm going to fall behind and that I'm not going to be as productive, especially during the pandemic when I have two full-time jobs, parenting and working. And that I feel sometimes that, oh, my other colleagues seem to not have to work that hard. So uh, there is that concept of, you know, you come with your networks, you come with that sort of privilege sometimes when you're uh, not in the underrepresented category of people. So how do you sort of address the aspect of privilege and the ability to take time off, for example? But this is an assumption that we make because I would actually throw it back to you and I would say, if you continue to work this hard, are you actually getting closer to your goals or are you getting further away from your goals because you're sacrificing your health and your emotional well-being and your relationship mm -hmm. with your family and your joy in your work? When you're burned out, you're not enjoying what you're doing. Your body is begging you to stop and you're not stopping. So we have to stop this, this assumption that the only way I can get ahead is by working extra hard. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. I, my parents um, are from Syria. I was born in Syria. My parents immigrated. We immigrated when I was five to Canada. I decided to go pursue a, a career in a field that was very male dominated technology and technology research and all of that. And, for, and I got into this mess because I had that same belief system. I thought I have to, I have to, how else can I repay the sacrifices that my parents made for me if I don't go out there and I don't take advantage of every single opportunity. But here's the thing. I did all of that and it made me sick. I did all of that and I couldn't actually do the work that I was supposed to do. And counterintuitively, as soon as I stopped, as soon as I stopped working so hard and started working very intentionally, very strategically, again, I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm saying work hard with your creativity, with your brain, with your body, with your cycles. Then the second I started doing that, my output actually went up. I started doing more work, better work. And guess what? I was going to the gym and I was being healthy and I was spending time with my family and I was feeling joy in my life mm -hmm. because nothing is as important as your health. And the thing about burnout is that burnout steals your health little by little by little. And by the time it hits you, it's too late because then it's going to take you months to recover. Mm -hmm. So I would actually, every time I would challenge everybody listening, every single time you find yourself thinking, I've got to keep hustling so I can get ahead. I really want you to turn that question around and say, am I actually getting ahead? Am I actually getting closer to my goals or am I getting closer to my goals, but I'm sick and I'm tired and I'm stressed out and I'm depressed and I'm anxious. Because if that's the case, then I would say you're not actually getting closer to your goals. You're getting further away from your goals. Okay. That, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted, wanted from this conversation. It's just, <laughs> Some real talk. The real talk. Exactly. I mean, there's no point in beating around the bush um, around these topics. So you're providing us with like, solid value. There's a question in the uh, chat box, and I'll quote from your book. You say, for us, the issue, and you were referring to your sister and you at that point, for us, the issue was never a lack of time but the crossing of boundaries that left us vulnerable to an infinite flow of requests, emails, meetings, and information. So I want to talk about the boundaries. I think Alexis has mentioned. Does the system that you, you know, you're talking about harmonize with the broader system? Do your colleagues respect your choices and your boundaries? I guess the, the overarching question is, yeah, how do you, uh, any tips for sort of setting those professional boundaries? Yeah. And I, you know, I run my own business now, but I interface with clients a lot. And when I first started after my burnout, um, when I started to pick things back up and I knew things could not be the same as they were before, one of the things that I did was I made every client sign an agreement, a very friendly agreement, but it was like, this is how we work, setting expectations for when I would respond to email, how long it would take me to respond and what that policy was. And my policy was I would answer them within a business day. So if they, if they emailed me at 9 a.m., they would get an answer before 5 p.m. that day, but I wasn't going to answer them in 15 minutes or five minutes or 30 seconds. But they also knew that if there was an emergency or something really time sensitive, they had my phone number, they can call me. And I remember being so nervous to send out that email to the first client because I thought, well, I'm going to tell these people, these are my clients, they're paying my bills, and I'm going to tell them that, you know, I'm not going to answer them for a whole business day, but I did it. And let me tell you, I have yet to have one client have a problem with this. 
Because the issue is that with a lot of times with boundaries, people might cross your boundaries because you're not making them clear. And if I say to somebody, my boundaries are, I'm going to respond to you within one business day, then they know that. And as long as they know that they're going to get a response, they're not going to be stressed out. They're not going to be like, did you get my email? Did you get my email? Did you get it? Because they know that they're going to get an answer. And when, then what I started doing the next level was I started blocking off complete days where I didn't take calls or meetings at all. Mm. And again, I was really worried. What happens if a client messages me on Monday and I'm not free until Wednesday? And I was so scared. And again, if there's something really time sensitive, obviously you'll make an exception. But what I found was that it was fine. If I had blocked off Tuesday, the client and I spoke on Wednesday because they had that expectation, they were able to respect it. I find that most often we impose this idea that we have to be instantly responsive on ourselves. Like, where does it say in the rule book that I need to answer your message in 30 seconds or in three minutes from, and like what we put that on ourselves and then we've created and technology really messes with our minds too. Think about when you get a message on WhatsApp and it gives the, the other person those two little blue check marks, letting them know that you've seen the message. Think of the pressure that that puts. But why, why should we put that pressure on ourselves? So yes, I have had to, my people respect my boundaries because I have been very polite about it. I really try to meet people where they are. If there's an emergency, call me. So they know if they need me, they can get me. But guess what? 95% of my inbox is not an emergency. 95% of my inbox can wait for four hours or six hours. It can wait for me to have lunch. It can wait for me to have a workout. And if there's an emergency, there's the phone. Somebody calls me and we deal with it. Just that small thing of reclaiming my time, of reclaiming my calendar, of also setting aside like days, right? Because when I set aside my no meeting days, that's me saying I'm prioritizing my research and my learning. When I take every single meeting that comes my way, that's me letting somebody else hijack my time. And that's me letting somebody else prioritize what I can do. Obviously with meetings and things like that, people have less flexibility, but we're now seeing organizations that are working together. Like Facebook, for example, has meeting free Fridays. So on Fridays, no meetings are scheduled companies. I know other companies that have meeting free Wednesdays or meeting free Mondays or like multiple days a week where there's no meetings. Mm -hmm. So I'd encourage you to talk to your teams and talk to your colleagues and talk to your students and talk to your professors and say, hey, can we establish some communication guidelines, especially during this pandemic, where maybe Fridays we just say no meetings and no emails. You know, we just give people Friday, we just give people a break to be able to stop and think. So once I did that. And even though I remember being so nervous, being like, I'm going to lose clients. They're going to think I'm high maintenance. No, I didn't. In fact, people appreciated it. And the best thing was that my clients emailed me and said, we're going to start doing this with our employees and with our clients, because why are we rushing to answer in all, you know, we're giving away our time when we should be using that time to think and to research. Can you deep dive into a research project? If every 30 minutes you have a call, if you spend half a day in calls all day, like, no, you're not going to be able to do that. Okay. I think at this, you know, I think someone asked a question about what could, um, that, that a lot of it is onus on us to sort of put those personal boundaries in place. So someone had asked, what could your system, like your, your institutional workplace changes, how could they do that? And I think you had mentioned this in the book as well, with Joe Biden's example, when he was vice president, how he sent leadership sends out and sets the expectations for what work culture should look like and i think in academia that should come from you know your professors and even above the professors for uh, again it, it, and it goes back to what you had said what is the metrics of success within academia so i think that rahaf answered that question a little bit about um how to sort of put those boundaries in place but also i think what you were suggesting was it should come from leadership as well where you set the tone for how it should go um, we have a question from Chris who says, I agree with everything you're saying and it truly resonates, but do you really think one can make these changes within such a culture without first pushing oneself over the edge? That is burnout. You said that you knew things like sleeping well, eating well, exercising were important, but it took something severe to really provide a reality check. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that you need to go as severe as I did in order to learn. I think what happened and what I'm seeing now is that people are finding my book because they're already feeling that things are not working. 
So I believe that you can't really convince somebody of something that they're not ready to hear and something that they're not ready to implement, which is why this book is really about giving people the information to, to deconstruct their own relationship with work and to deconstruct their own role of these forces. So like my hope, is that somebody who feels like, hey, I'm getting really run down or hey, like I'm uh, the way that I'm working isn't really working for me anymore, that they pick this book up, they get to the chapter where it asks them to identify their work culture relationships, their work heroes, and then they start recognizing they start recognizing, um, you know, their, how these forces are showing up in their own lives and it allows them to correct that ship a little bit because I just didn't know. But now that I know, I'm telling people, and I'm not, if you, if you, if you recall, Chris, like I'm not telling people rest. I'm not telling people take a break. I'm telling people challenge your own ideas of what you think hard work means. Challenge, like ask yourself questions like, what does my work ethic, what role does my work ethic play in my identity? What did my parents tell me about success? Who do I admire as being role models of success? What does it take to be successful? So like these are, this is something that I think we, this is the conversation we need to have because if you don't intrinsically feel if you're not motivated inside, like inside your heart, not to sound all woo, but if you're not motivated inside of your heart to prioritize intentional recovery as a part of high performance, I can lecture for four hours and tell you to take breaks up and down until I'm, till I lose my voice and you're not going to do it. So I can't tell you what to do. I can only tell you to like, find your why, the why you're working, dismantling that. And then once you dismantle that, people tend to naturally correct their behavior anyway. Okay. Yeah, that was some solid advice. I mean, I, I want to jump back to what you were saying because you had mentioned it earlier about self-worth and morality and identity and how they're interlocked with our worldview and our work view. Uh, you caution us in the book to sort of dissociate our identity as a person with that of our professional identities. And you mentioned that earlier. You said, we link who we are with what we do. We hang our self-esteem and self-worth on a precarious ledge. Um, we feel good and do well when our, our professional identities do well, but for some reason, and in academia, the academic job market's terrible, the pandemic, uh, there's no, there's things under, uh, outside of your control, and you have decreased productivity due to factors out of your control. What mm -hmm. should I do? Where, you know, how do I sort of now readjust that self-worth and move my self-esteem away from that precarious ledge that you mentioned? I think it's what we were talking about, recentering in yourself and telling yourself, like, you know, who am I? What, you know, many people never question their sense of self-worth. Many people would have a difficult time. If I told you one of the exercises that my friend who's a psychotherapist recommends is to take a piece of paper and to write, I am enough on it. Mm -hmm. And to see what feelings come up when you write that because many people have a hard time writing that down. Many people don't feel like they're enough and we've been conditioned and shaped to think that the only way that we can make up for this feeling of not being enough is to constantly chase doing more, being more, having more. Where in reality, if that you can't fill that hole inside of you, if, if, if you know, with stuff or with work or with professional uh, accreditation or with being published or with accolades, you can't fill that hole. So you have to start by fixing the foundation of your spiritual house. You have to start by saying, I am enough. And look, I love my job. I love what I do. I really find it interesting. I find it very intellectually fulfilling, but I don't believe anymore that I was put on this planet to do research. Like research is not the end all be all purpose of my soul. I just, you know, and I, people have different belief systems and that's totally fine. I personally believe that you're just put on this planet for a very short period of time to just experience joy, live as best you can, love the people that you love for as long as you get to have them. That's all we get, you know, tomorrow isn't promised. And so the idea that like billions of years of evolution put me in this time and the space time continuum right now so that I can like do tech research, like, no. So we need to start to disassociate ourselves from that. And that might mean, as I'm seeing people in the, in the comments mentioned, that might mean realizing that the system that you're in like isn't meant for you. Mm -hmm. If you've tried your best to apply your own boundaries, if you've tried your best to thrive, if you've tried your best to take breaks, but the system is still sucking out your life force, then that you need to find another system. And many people do, right? But there's so many more opportunities for people right now than existed even five years ago. There's so many other options and there's so many other ways for people to find it. But I just think your life is so precious and your time and your attention are so precious and your health is so precious 
-hmm. Like when your body starts attacking itself, when your hair starts falling out, it's like, what professional goal is worth that? So if I can stop one person from hitting that rock bottom by getting them to just question some of their own narratives, the immigrant background, the, the guilt of, you know, of, of, of justifying your parents' sacrifice, uh, being a woman in a male-dominated industry, feeling like you always have to do more, feeling like you don't have the same amounts of privilege. Okay, all of that, I can't change any of that. All I can change is I can say, how can I design a system for me that I can excel in my performance? And me excelling in my performance means performing sustainably. It doesn't mean performing really well for six months and then being unable to do anything for two years. It means performing sustainably. If, if the audience was having sort of an internal battle of, you know, I can, but I can, I can't, I can, I'm with you. Um, it was so hard because it's, it's so many years of conditioning. It's so many years of telling ourselves that in order to be successful, we need to do A, B, and C. So if you're feeling that way, I completely understand. And I think what Rahaf is suggesting and I will talk about it a little bit later is also step by step. It's not to be done like today. Like you no, just, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, no, it takes time. It takes time. And you know what I'll say? I'll say one more thing, which is I, I think it's the question I always ask myself when I was going through this process. You're absolutely right. It's a continuous conversation with yourself is I just said, well, the things I was doing before weren't actually working for me. So is what you're doing working for you? If it is, congratulations, like do you live your best life, right? But if it's not working for you, then that's an invitation for you to explore another way. Yeah, if you if you notice me uh, skipping some questions, I think Rahaf is answering them uh, while she's talking anyway, but I'll get to the specific portions of your questions that we still unanswered. Uh, for example, we talked about boundaries, but Natalie, I uh, was asking to everyone in the chat, uh, can you describe navigating whether burnout is something that can be solved through intentional scheduling? And when do you see it as a sign that you do not belong in that particular field or that firm? And then someone else asks, um, could you recommend something like journaling to practice this? So I guess people are looking for practical to do uh, strategies to handle not burning out. Sure. I think I answered Natalie's question in the sense that if you've tried everything that you can think of and the system is still impacting your health negatively, then you've just, you've got to go. Like you just have to go. Um, if you've tried setting boundaries and talking to your colleagues and taking, uh, you know, control of your calendar, if you've tried managing your energy, if you've done everything that you could possibly think to do and it's still not working for you, then that's an indication that maybe you need to revisit if this is a goal that you want to pursue. In terms of practical things, it sounds really easy what I'm going to tell you, but it's actually very, very difficult, but I'm going to say it and I'm going to challenge all of you listening here to do this. I have something that I recommend people do. It's called the Fushi 15 and that's in the next 48 hours. I want you to find 15 minutes in your calendar, put it in your calendar where you're going to sit down and you're gonna stare at a wall. You're not gonna meditate, you're not gonna clear your head, you're not gonna count your breaths, you're not gonna do anything. You're just gonna literally sit without any devices nearby and you're just gonna stare at a wall for 15 minutes. And what that does is that de-stimulates your brain, that brings everything down, brings the adrenaline down, the anxiety down, the stimulation down, and it just gives your brain a chance to rest and reset. And if you do this for 15 minutes, one, I guarantee that you're going to feel better. Two, I guarantee if you start doing it regularly, you're going to have more energy in your day. And three, you're going to start noticing that for your cycles of creativity, that if you, you're going to do a hard task, if after you do a complicated task, you take 15 minutes and you just sit somewhere and you stare at a wall, then the next task that you do, you're going to, you're going to come at it with better energy. And this is something that you can do, even as I saw somebody also mentioned before, um, even if you have time constraints around experiments with animals or cells or things like that, you can find 15 minutes in your day in order for you to do this. You can find multiple times during your day. You can find an hour in your day for 15 minute chunks to just sit down and do nothing. And that should be a core part of how you improve your skills. But here's the thing, let me, add, let me add one more thing, is if you don't do it, because I tell people to do it, they say they're gonna do it and then they don't do it. Your homework is if you don't do it, you have to get out a piece of paper and write down why you did do it. 
Did you think it was dumb? Did you think, did you not have enough time? Whatever it is, those reasons will indicate to you that there is something in you that doesn't believe that recovery is a good idea. And mm-hmm. that's what you need to dig into. Yeah, I think, yeah, in response to uh, some of the comments in the in the chat box, I think that's exactly the, the sort of the response that I would say as well is like, it's 15 minutes. And if 15 minutes feels like a lot, and that for me as well, it's like, I don't have time to eat. Um, then there's something that you need to question, like your, your internal belief system. Um, yeah. I'll ask you in face question in a second, but I was going to say that you had said in the book, through it all, I berated myself for not being able to get it together, for not writing enough, missing word count deadlines, not waking up at 5 a.m. to journal and drink kale smoothies. And mm-hmm. you posed the question a few days ago on Instagram, I think, what if you're already doing enough? So in, in academia, it doesn't feel like you, you're ever doing enough. Your research is never quite over. There's always one more experiment, one more chapter to write. How do you recognize when you're doing enough and be confident in the kind of work that you're doing to be able to factor in that 15 minutes of staring at a wall? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, and it's funny with academia, it's very similar to, to the research that I do, which is there's always something else to research. There's always another report to read, another chapter to write, another thing to do, but it's making peace with the fact that we live in an infinite information ecosystem. Why are you trying to race to the end when there is no end? So why do we keep trying to get to inbox zero when inbox zero doesn't exist because the second your emails are all gone, a whole new batch comes in. Why are you trying to get to the end you know, instead of just saying this is a journey and I'm going to I'm going to go as far as I can today reasonably because because you're going to be judged on the sum of your journey, not on how hard you ran certain days of it. Right. So I had to really change my mindset around this because I work in information that evolves very rapidly, but I'm never going to be able to read all the books. I'm never going to be able to do all the research, do all the experiments. So I've made my peace with the fact that I'm going to try to do my best. And to me, my best means that I really give my best effort every single day that I can, but I do it within the constraints of, I also refuse to sacrifice my health. I refuse to sacrifice my relationships and I refuse to sacrifice my joy. Those are three things that I just do not want to do. So within those parameters, I will work really hard. I'm working on a new book now. It's, you know what I mean? Like I'm doing all sorts of things. I'm teaching. I have a consultant company. I work, um, I'm, I'm working on a new book. I'm doing consultant, like I'm doing all these big projects, but it's like, you know what? I'm not super busy. And I refuse to believe in anybody saying, oh, I'm super, super busy. It's like, no, we don't need to do everything all the time. We're already doing enough. So ask yourself at the end of every day, what does enough look like for you? And maybe that's the point of departure. Maybe if, if I asked you, you know, if I said, you know, Roshni, what does enough look like for you? How mm-hmm. many reports is it? How many chapters is it? How many publications is it? And then if it forced you to put a number down, like what would that number be? And then say, is that number realistic for the time frame that you're putting under? And if it's it, and if not, what can you do to adjust so that it makes it a bit more realistic? If you say my goal is to publish a hundred papers in a year that would be doing enough. Well, you know, then we'll have a conversation because I just don't think that's sustainable or attainable. Right. I mean, you're a futurist. I mean, the, the, the you know, in, in conversations that I followed um, where you speak, you know, you're thinking about tomorrow, basically taking these concepts and applying it to the future. In fact, in the beginning, you mentioned knowledge economy and I didn't know what it meant. I am not an economist and I had no idea what it meant, but it is uh, basically what it is, is it's the economy of developed nations, and I had to look it up, and that it's dependent on human capital and intangible assets such as tech, data analytics, financial modeling, innovation. And for the engineers in the in the room, um, you know, which is basically you, an economy fueled by innovation, research, and rapid tech advancement. You you talk about that exact concept, and you speak about it in terms of AI and artificial intelligence. And you said with the coming of AI and automation and robots. Working smarter or harder is not going to solve the problem. Can you expand a little bit more about the future of work um, as it relates to AI? Yeah. So what we're seeing now is that the same sort of AI revolution that took over a lot of the manufacturing jobs is now starting to transform knowledge industries. So you have AIs that perform financial analysis and big hedge funds that perform legal tasks and big legal firms that help doctors diagnose things, that help um, look over contracts, that help journalists do research, that help write books, that help, you know, like we're seeing this coming. And so the bigger picture, and I'm not saying this is happening tomorrow or next year, but the bigger picture is 
we are moving towards an age where technology is going to be increasingly capable of doing the work that humans currently do, which means there might be a lot of new tech jobs in some respects, but there might be a lot less of the jobs as we know them today or the jobs that exist today. So we're going to go through this transitionary period where there's going to be a segment of the population that might not have an availability of work the way that they're used to. So if we keep telling people that their identity is their jobs, what is going to happen to them and what's going to happen to us as a society when entire segments of the population lose that foundation upon which they've built their entire sense of self? And so this is the type of thing. And people, you know, they say, oh, when I talk to people, they're like, oh, well, I don't work in a factory. It's like, well, are you a lawyer, a bank teller, a financial analyst, a journalist, a researcher, an Mm -hmm. academic? Because there is AI that is working on all of those fields. And maybe not now, but it's exponential. Maybe in five years, you'll have a an AI that can like with a blink of an eye, write a research paper and can pull sources from 10, can run experiments, you know, at a pace that humans can't. And this is what we're kind of moving towards. And so the bigger question to me isn't what's going to happen with robots or what's going to happen with people's jobs. Like, I think we can figure all of that out. The me, the bigger, to me, the bigger problem is the psychological and emotional devastation that's going to happen when you take this away from people. Mm-hmm. Because if you take it away, we, we've seen this in different parts of the U.S. where when certain jobs disappear, the, 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 the trauma of losing that sense of economic identity results in increased drug use, increased domestic violence, increased crime. Mm-hmm. And these are all problems that are like socially based, even though, believe it or not, when the, when the manufacturing jobs, they disappeared, it wasn't like people weren't able to find other work. They were able to find work. They just weren't able to find the same jobs that they had before. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, I think Yunfei was sort of tying it into the gig economy, um, I'm, mm-hmm. I think, which is, would it, wouldn't it be nice if creative workers don't have to consistently output creativity to get the money for essential daily supply. I love the idea of universal basic income. And I'm going to put a big asterisk on that and say, I know we haven't quite figured it out yet, but you know, people like Stephen Hawking's and Bill Gates, they really believe in this idea, this idea that people can get a base stipend that they could, um, you know, get a certain amount of money for day-to-day living. I think it's possible. I think it's possible considering the amount of money that some of these big AI firms kind of earn. I think it's absolutely possible. But I think that would force us to rethink the way that we look at people and the value that they bring to their society. Once again, I think the biggest barrier isn't going to be the technology. It's not going to be the business model. It's not going to be the economics. I actually believe the biggest problem is going to be that people have such strong feelings against the idea of giving somebody else something for free. I think the idea of giving somebody money without them earning it just rubs against this massive identity that we have with our work, the American dream, bootstrapped, you know, rags to riches, the story that we tell ourselves that the only way to achieve success is to work hard. Well, what if all of a sudden we give people money, then it's like that completely shakes up our foundation of our worldview. And I think that's going to be the biggest point of resistance for us. Okay, and I think we have a comment um, based on what you just said from Sam, who says if people feel intrinsically valued and their government at least believes in them, um, then their brains and effort will gravitate towards their best intrinsic value and that they'll be productive uh, in mm-hmm. an, ultimately in an economically efficient way. Um, Absolutely. It was, you mentioned this in the book as well. For those who are considering you know, the book and should you get it? Absolutely. Um, it's just it's just for everyone. I learned a lot. Uh, I was just gonna you know ask one question because at the end of the day we are I am or at least my office and some of my colleagues here we're the career office. Uh, we don't explicitly you know work within academia, but we support our students who are in academia. And you had mentioned that for when it comes to careers or your life's purpose, you don't have to have a purpose with a capital P. You said we need to break free of the seductive narrative and enjoy life for what it is. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what that means. You don't have to have a purpose with a capital P. Yeah, I don't think, I think you can find work that's intellectually stimulating and fulfilling and that challenges you, but it's not like spirit, it's not your spiritual calling. I don't really believe in having a calling. 
kind of what I said earlier. I don't believe like I was put on this planet to research tech trends. Like I love what I do. I find it interesting, fulfilling. It pays the bills, but it is not my purpose. And I think we've gotten into a society where we work so much that work has replaced a lot of other segments of like public life and citizenship life that people would have normally participated in, like volunteering, for example, or doing things with nonprofit organizations or donating your time to good causes, like, or even being a part of a spiritual association or a religious association. Like those are all things that work has eaten away in many cases because people are working so much. So now Mm -hmm. we're turning to work and we're saying, well, work not only should pay the bills, it should also be spiritually fulfilling as well. And I think that's really damaging. I think it sets people up to fail because now they expect their jobs to pay their mortgage and to give them divine meaning in their life. And it's just a job. It's perfectly okay to have a job just to pay the bills. That is absolutely fine. It's perfectly okay to have a job that you're not necessarily super crazy about, but you know what, like it's stable and it lets you do all the other things in your spare time that you want to do. So that's fine too. We have to stop expecting people that they're going to have this like utopian experience in their career where they're going to do something that's going to be aligned with their soul's calling every day. Mm -hmm. If you want to help causes, like do your job and then go help out in your community, you know, go. So, and yes, it's always good to, to work with organizations that are aligned with your world vision. And if you're lucky enough to have that opportunity and lucky enough to have that privilege, good for you. And like, that's incredible for you, but many people don't. And I think we create a level of shame around people who don't have those types of jobs as though those jobs are less good, or those jobs Mm -hmm. are somehow lesser in value when, whether you are, you know, a sanitation worker or a janitor or a teacher or a banker, like your job doesn't define you. You're still an incredible human being who's worthy and whose contributions to society shouldn't be defined by their economic contribution to GDP. Yeah, and you you mentioned this beautifully is, you know, be mindful of the people who are your work heroes or your your, your mod- models and who you emulate. Just for the audience, like Beyonce is amazing. Of course, she's amazing, but she also had burnout, you mentioned. And then Elon uh, Musk, I was watching a video where he broke down because of how much uh, he recollected how much he was sleeping, you know, where he was working. And then Bill mm-hmm. Gates, we idolize these people. Like, of course, they did amazing things, but Bill Gates, for example, used to track his employees' uh, um, license plate numbers to see what's coming in and out. Uh, you know, I could relate that to so many uh, academic advisors who are keeping tabs on their students swiping, you know, on their labs. So, you mm. know, be careful of who you emulate um, when it comes to, when it comes to, you know, your work heroes. And you and and one thing that really struck me, and I'm ending this out to be respectful of your, your time, Rahaf, and you have another Thank engagement, you. is being busy isn't a badge of honor. And that for me, and you said, if you could help one person today, that for me was really important to hear because I was one of those people who was, you know, sharing on my Instagram stories, oh my gosh, I can't breathe, blah, 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 I can't eat. And that's not a badge of honor for sure. Um, So I just wanted to, you know, thank you. I think I addressed all the questions in the chat box. And I think we covered a lot of topics in a short period of time. Um, Someone was asking about details to buy the book. What I'll do is I'll send the video recording if you wanted to share it with your friends and then mention the link to buy the book as well uh, and also send out um, i would love to hear your feedback about these kinds of conversations so we know if we want to have more of these conversations so thank you so much rahaf i'm getting side notifications saying this was amazing can they have the recording so uh, we were not wrong thank you. Um, in reaching out to you and you know what your main sort of standout quality is that compassion and that's why we we reached out and that self-kindness so thank you for that well thank you so much and if i can just say if you do read the book and you do like it please consider giving it a review on amazon they're so helpful in bumping up the book's visibility to other readers and i would just appreciate it so very much so thank you thank you very much thank you so much rahaf i'll share with you the comments we're getting some amazing